Hi everyone, welcome to the talk about DevOps for Ansible Lightspeed with IBM Watson Code Assistant. Um, my name is James, James Wong. Um, I'm with Red Hat and before the start, I would like to, uh, so which button? Oh, not this one, sorry. Come on, no? It's, it's live, right? So, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce a little bit about myself. Um, that's my uh, Twitter. And I'm fascinated by two things. Uh, first of all, uh, things of scale. You know, a system that process huge amount of data or request and with a sustained um, performance and all these factors, that's, these things fascinated me. And the second thing is I love automating things. Um, I hate people doing tedious tasks and made mistakes by, because they have to do these kind of boring stuff. And from another aspect, it's also about scale. I love to scale up teams, you know? Once you get rid of all these tedious, boring, easy to make mistake things, the team can move much, much uh, faster. Now, so, okay, so that means I need to raise my voice, all right? Okay, um, is it better? Yeah, all right, cool. So I need to know a little bit about you too. Because I need, I need, hopefully I could adjust my presentation a little bit according to the audience here. How many of you are a software developer? You write applications. Okay, good. And any automation engineer? All right, cool. So I see double uh, raising two times. Those people are that lobs people, I think. Anyone write Ansible playbooks? Awesome. Anyone write uh, Terraform? Uh, Puppet and things like that, Chef? Yes, okay, cool. Any machine learning engineers here? Okay. Any data scientists who tune, train models? All right, cool, nice, okay. Um, so this is the agenda. Uh, I'll try to uh, sh uh, uh, share a little bit what is Lightspeed, and then we're gonna go through a little bit high-level architecture and then we're gonna talk about the platform that runs the service, and then the pipeline that we built to um, carry out the, from PR all the way to production. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about lessons learned, some highlights, and then if, hopefully we have time for Q&A. Make sense? Yeah? Thanks. Um, disclaimers. We try to focus on the engineering perspectives here, uh, and only on the stack that is serving the forthcoming free technical preview, all right? So anything I said about future architecture changes, product updates, feature launches, do not trust me, all right? Here, what is Ansible Lightspeed with IBM Watson Code Assistant? It is two things. One is the Ansible Lightspeed, and the other one is IBM Watson Code Assistant. Combining two, it's an AI service, and we do two things. One is to help users, like all our automation engineers, to build automation code with consistency and with quality. And then the second thing, uh, not obvious, but actually very important. We try to do content matching, meaning we try to credit those who contribute all these code to um, where the mo which this model has been trained on. So what I'm gonna do is a quick demo to show you the two functions that this Ansible Lightspeed is doing. And then what you will need is a VS Code and a, the Ansible plugin. Uh, you need a GitHub account and you also need to sign up for closed beta. Any one of, of you have signed up for the closed beta? Oh, awesome, so you probably know what I'm doing here now already. Um, all right, let's go to the demo. And this is a live demo, and I hope, but they won't be able to see me. Okay, so that's fine, that's fine, I can stand. Um, so here, this is the Ansible plugin. Um, 
And after you set up the plugin, you go to the settings, you type in light speed, and it will filter out these three options for you. Enable these two, and then also type in the, um, the, the API uh, endpoint here. Then you go here, you're gonna see this Ansible icon here. Click on it, you have a connect button. All right, go through the normal process of going through um, login. It's a GitHub login, authorize it, and then you go back to your VS Code, open up. Now, you see here, it shows me as logged in as James. And then you could take a look at here, you could sign out from here if you are done with it or you don't want it to keep it. Once it's done, now you can actually go to do your um, Ansible Lightspeed uh, code recommendation. So I pre-bake a empty or a template file here. Now, you, if you check your status bar, you're gonna see Ansible is detected, detecting the ML file. And there is a Lightspeed icon here. And you're gonna see this icon spinning when it's doing the uh, inferencing. So here, a simple task, let's say, I wanna create an AWS S3 bucket called full. Enter it. Sorry, the font? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Better? Uh, don't ask too much. Okay, here, uh, okay, see, okay, now it's already up here. You distract me, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is, you see the content right here, right? Now the recommend, recommendation comes back. Uh, it's up to the user to accept it or not. If you want to accept it, hit the tap keyboard, uh, key, and then it, it's in now here. Um, so the next one, I kind of vary it a little bit. I, I don't use the call, but use name to bar. I want to show you that this is a language uh, model that could you know, interpret, even though you vary the, the language a little bit. Um, again, see the spinning light speed? Oh, it's very fast. I couldn't even move, move my cursor to it. You accept it, and pay attention to the lower, lower window here. This is a, um, the content matching output here. It shows you um, the, the, the model recommendation is based on these inputs. Uh, from the, the, the three entries here. Now, if I come to the another example here, mount the volume to uh, media shared, and you're gonna pay attention here, you're gonna be changing after I res accept it, okay? Let me tap key, oh, oh, did I miss that? Sorry, let's do one more time. Okay, I accept it, and then you're gonna see this be refreshed. Right, so it changed. If you open them up, they're gonna give you the URL uh, of these content coming, of, coming from. All right, the network's a little bit slow, but you get the idea, All right? So, yep, that's, that's the uh, demo for the Lightspeed itself. All right, I hope you feel useful. And uh, now, you're gonna go through the high-level architecture. I would walk you through through the two workflows that we have just demoed. The first one is the code recommendations. And from the left-hand side, when the user hands on their VS Code, they type the Ansible task description, step zero. You know why it's step zero? Because I forgot to put this step in and I hate to shift the number, so I put the number zero here. It enter the task description, you hit enter, the plugin will send a request to the API endpoint. And this API endpoint, first of all, you would do, you would talk, you would talk to the Redis cache, you would talk to the Postgres database to do some kind of housekeeping work. For example, user validation, for example, rate limiting, because it is gonna be a free service, we wanna make sure everyone have a fair share of usage of the platform, among other things. After the housekeeping where it's done, it will forward the request to a inference service, which is a running IBM Watson runtime, serving the models. From there, it's gonna return you the recommendations, and the API would do some more uh, post-processing work. One of it is anonymizing the input and output, and we're gonna be collecting them into a data, data analysis um, service, uh, we're gonna be using those to analyze the input output and also potentially use them to further retrain the models for better better recommendation. 
And then we return the combination back to the VS Code that you see showing up there. And then it's up to the user to decide to accept it or not. A little bit more on the, this API endpoint for the code recommendations. One of the post-processing we do here is running a service called Ansible Risk Insights. Basically, it's a set of rules that we run it against the recommendation. And then, because we want to make sure the codes are consistent, the codes have good quality, the Ansible kind of approve it off. And this is, I think this is something that stands out because we have this huge Ansible community. We have this uh, kind of knowledge of how well a Ansible playbook or task should be written uh, to guarantee a, a, a risk level low and also a um, good quality of work here. So now the next workflow is the content matching. Here is after you get back the recommendation, if you should hit tab, accepting the results, it, the VS plugin would talk to the another MP, API endpoints, which is we name it as attributions. It tried to do a, um, the content matching. So it will encode the um, input and output uh, and, and using the encode the key to do a, a hit a elastic search that we built. And that will return what you have seen on the screen that they match the content, you know, attributing or trying to credit um, those uh, who have contributed to these um, codes. Okay, so that's the two workflow here. So basically, you're gonna see, you, you have seen that we have API services, we have model serving behind scene, we have um, database, Elasticsearch, and we have some outside uh, third party services help us with the um, um, event processing and, and, and analysis. Now, coming to the platform. So this is the platform that is running the service. Uh, down below, that is the OpenShift, and it's, it is a managed service running on AWS. We call it Rosa. And then on top of that, we have the Red Hat OpenShift AI. Uh, it's the upstream of this project, of this product is the Open Data Hub. Anyone use Open Data Hub? All right, cool. So um, among other things, um, the one that we are mainly using in this stack is the um, KSurf and uh, it's running the IBM Watson runtime. So because that platform allow us to put in different runtime, um, whichever that match your usage. And then the other component here is a Red Hat advanced cluster security. Um, the first thing we, we want to make sure is that we are running on a secured uh, platform. And this uh, service will scan the cluster for vulnerabilities and send us alerts if they, there are some that's been discovered. And on top of it, we run Ansible Lightspeed there. Uh, why we use these components? Make a good guess, anyone? Why we pick these? Yeah? Because what? Because Red Hat. Because Red Hat. Yes, right? Okay, that, that, can, that can be it, and, but any, any more, any, any others? Okay, so it's really depending on your team. So our team is small, and we want to keep the team lean, and we also want to keep the team focused on building the service. So we look for system components that are managed, that are supported. And we believe that we let people who are good at doing their things, let them do it. Let them do it the best way that they could. And we focus on things that we know better. And then the second is that we want to find something that's hybrid cloud ready. Because today we offer it as a cloud service. We own everything, right? But if later on we decided to have a on-prem offering, you know, some customer may, may want to run the whole stack in their own data center. So we pick the components, you know, try to fit these two criteria. Make sense? No? Yes? <laughs> okay, so now the platform, I want to talk a little bit about the CI CD side of it. So we, the three major components here, the first one is Ansible, and we mainly use Ansible to do the infrastructure creation 
for example, creating the cluster, creating the VPC, the network, the RDS, Redis cache, we use Ansible to provision those. Um, and then the second component is uh, GitHub Actions. And that is mainly for the CI, um, the PRL check, uh, uh, testing, unit test, uh, t uh, static analysis, things like that. And the last one, it's a very uh, key component in our whole stack is the Red Hat OpenShift GitOps. The upstream of it is the Argo CD. And we enjoy, we love using this Argo CD. It's a one of the components that bridge all these from PR all the way to uh, deployment into the production. So now I would like to talk a little bit on the pipeline. The pipeline would carry out this task from a PR all the way to production. Uh, we try to do this thing. We try to shift as much of the testing to the left as possible. So at the PR stage, we would like to do as much full testing as early as possible. So in a PR stage, we would like to have it's a full stack deployment that is as close to the production as possible. And then we could, and we also want to automate the process to set up this so that at the PR stage, either the developer or the QE engineers, they could already start testing the PR in its whole in, uh, full stack integrity. And then by the time when someone clicks, say, we're going to merge the PR, we are pretty confident, high confident, that the, once this is merged into the main branch, the main branch will still be very production ready. All right? So that's our goal. Here, this is the pipeline at the beginning of the pipeline, the PR check. So for each of the PR, it will go through the regular, normally you would do, unit test, you know, uh, code coverage, um, static analysis. And then it will build, if it passes, it will build the image and push it to Quay. Once it's done, it will trigger a deployment. And this deployment will deploy to the, uh, a dev cluster and it will have the whole stack of what I just show you, the architecture. We have the Lightspeed service, we have Postgres, Redis, and the Watson runtime behind it. And then we can carry out the test. We could do ad hoc testing. You could run your automated test against it. You could use this stack to develop your testing suite as well. And now bring us to the whole pipeline from end to end. The left hand side you see is the PR checks uh, step that we just have talked into a little bit more detail. So once the developers decided, hey, let's merge it, you merge the domain and it will build a release candidates image and push to Quay. When this is done, it will trigger the deployment to the staging cluster. So this staging cluster is almost a mirror to the production cluster. So once it's deployed, we have two set of tests. One is the post deployment testing. So it's the regular test suite, full stack, hitting it. And then the second one is a performance testing. Um, this testing will be aiming to make sure that what has been changed won't change the performance portfolio or, 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 or the nature of the performance of the stack too much or you know, surprisingly. Once these are all passing, then we will deploy to a production environment, the cluster. Again, in the production cluster, we have production uh, testing suite hitting it, and we also would have performance testing hitting it. So some of these are not automated yet. For example, the performance testing, at this moment, we're still doing a manual step carrying out, but we are moving uh, trying to automate as much as possible uh, moving forward. Now, some of the highlights that we have learned, a um, couple of them, uh, a few of them. Uh, the first one is that to automate or not to automate. Uh, the team established uh, at the beginning of this year, and we really have just a few months to productize it. We had a demo during last, uh, I think it was October uh, summit, uh, Red Hat summit. Uh, but that, at the moment, it's really just a demo. And the, for, for the last six months, or less than six months, we try to productize it. Um, so uh, for purists, see, you want to automate everything, right? You, want, you don't want to do, like I said, I, I love to automate everything. And you want to keep everything as code, right? Inf infrastructure, your testing, your process, your deployment, everything in a code. 
You want to do that. It's lovely. It's great. But pragmatists, they would have to think about something else. They want to make sure that we can make it to the market. Time to market is a pressure. It's a value that, is, that a lot of time trumps, you know, something ideal system you want to create. You would want to have a MVP, minimum viable product creator as soon as possible. And then you want to really get it going out and allow people to start testing it and collecting feedback so that you could adjust and you could pivot. So what happened to us is it's really about whether to automate or not. It's about when to do what. So we set our priority. Uh, the first thing we want focusing on our, our effort, uh, engineering effort on automating is those daily operations, those frequent operations. Because these work, it could drag down the team, you know, spend their effort, precious effort on doing daily or frequent. So these are things like, for example, the testing framework, uh, the PR checks, the deployment mechanisms. So these things we want to automate um, as soon as possible. And then the second uh, priority is, in the priority list, is focusing on the security. For example, secret management, secret rotation, vulnerability monitoring, all these things are also on the top of the priority list. And don't take me wrong, we didn't do this on the first sprint or second sprint, no. We make progress on every sprint. And we, uh, at the same time, creating features, and then we adding all these automations uh, along, the, along the, the sprinting. So there are some other tasks we kind of decided to postpone them. For example, automating the infrastructure creation. So these things are not being done frequently, right? So for example, creating the OpenShift cluster, creating, setting up the VPC or RDS. You, we don't create them, do them every day or every sprint. So we decided to use manual step to carry them out at the beginning, and we document it. And then once we have the documented list, uh, we, so for example, you see we have multiple clusters. Then we will allow different team members to go through the uh, manual steps to validate that that step works. And these documents are useful because when later on you actually want to carry out your automation, that steps, those playbooks, many playbooks, it's what you're going to be targeting at to automating them. And what we are aiming at is try to get to the state of a thermal production. We want to come to a state that we want to uh, click button, create a cluster, and deploy all these components, and then the service. And then we could throw away uh, the other cluster if you think that is too, uh, we're already done with it, we already, or we want to exercise DR, all these things like that. Or we want to carry out a blue green deployment up to the top level of the whole architect system architecture. Now, the second lesson I would like to talk about is about the machine learning service. So the model testing, it's, it's quite different from regular application development. I have done, I've helped teams to, um, uh, to uh, move their whole pipeline to continuous deployment. That is when user, when engineer click the merge of the PR, it will all the way go through the staging test, uh, deployment uh, testing, and then if testing all good, it will automatically be deployed to production and serving the end users. I've done that before. But machine learning, it's quite different. Um, the testing of it, it's quite, it's fuzzy. There's not easy to say black and white. Oh, this testing came back to be positive, and that's good. Now let's move on to production right away. Because a lot of time we figure, we found out that a new model version, it can be one step forward for certain aspects of it. And then it could be two steps backward for some other aspects. So we have to make a judgment, hey, is this worth to move forward, to move this to a production or not? So it's not easy to judge by a test suite, or at least not now, you put it this way. It, maybe it's our lacking of understanding the nature and come up with a solid logic to make a decision on it. Um, so the approach we adopt is we have multiple uh, models simultaneously deployed. And then we use feature flags, and we use the deployment model of blue-green canary to do that. So at the beginning, we have only one Argo CD application that have every component that you have seen on the architecture 
in one, one uh, application of Argo, C, uh, of Argo CD. But now when we move along the development cycle, we figure this out, we break them up, break it up into multiple applications. So the individual uh, components in its own can be evolved independently and also can be scaled independently. Now, also for machine learning service, uh, one thing we learn is, uh, is that we have to identify the clearly uh, work workflows or GPU bound work workflow or uh, workload or CPU bound. Once you identify that, you could effectively pinning this workload on the corresponding um, compute node types. You know, GPU node is expensive. CPU node is much cheaper, and you want to make sure you're running on them effectively. And you also want to learn a little bit more understanding on the runtime, uh, the GPU batch processing, and the time slicing. You know, how effective, how efficient they are really for you, and whether they match the response time pro uh, profile that you are looking for. And the last one is observability. So it's very important. Um, some people mistake that observability is when you are running a production environment, you want to monitor it. So it's not just for that. During the development testing cycle, you want to have a good observability into your system because that helps you identify bottlenecks, that helps you identify code quality issues. Um, the, the tools that here list is what we are using. We're using for metrics is the Prometheus, Grafana, and Dynatrace is coming. Uh, we're going to be adopting Dynatrace for that. And uh, for tracing, we use Jaeger. And we actually just recently enabled Jaeger tracing. And it's done by an intern. Okay, That's pretty cool. And the, uh, the, for the logs, we use, use CloudWatch for now. Yep, so this is observability. Now, um, any questions? I, I can't, uh, so uh, can, can you, sorry, I, I can't hear exactly. So yeah. when do I, re, do I retrain the models do when you user? When the end user modify the playbooks, yeah. do we train a model at that? Yeah. So, um, so as of now, my, so okay, let me make it clear. The model training belongs to the IBM Watson uh, code assistance team. So my, uh, I don't have entire detail into how they carry out that, but my understanding is that they carry out the training on the Galaxy. So when you are doing it yourself, you, you wouldn't be directly or real time in training on that. But we do collect some of the, like I said, those inputs and batch process it and being trained the other, in the other round of the, the training trip. Yeah, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Any other questions? No? Uh, how much time we have now? Uh, oh, one more question? Yes. Huh? What's the plan for future? Okay, you are, you're asking me to say something you don't want to trust me. Um, so the, the next step is to open this up. So now it's closed beta, right? You have to sign up. Um, forthcoming, we're going to have a technology preview. So everyone have with a GitHub ID, you can go in, sign up, and try it. And um, the, then after that, uh, we would hopefully we would have a commercial, commercial offering um, that hopefully will pay the bill, right? So but all these just me talking, all right? And like I said, Potentially, some customers say, I want on-prem, right? I, I want to train on my own data. Like, for example, we have um, Automation Hub, which is the private uh, or the um, a private version for corporations, right, of Galaxy, right? So they want to train the model on their own, you know, data set, their co uh, playbooks. That, that could be, you know, forthcoming. Does that help you? Okay, yeah. 
Oh, sorry, just one more that. So at this moment, you see that the automation, the, the recommendation is on task level, right? So hopefully, we'll come to the point that we could recommend the whole playbooks level, and maybe later on, whole module collection, something like that. Yeah, and, and our product manager is dreaming that one day you tell the system, and then it will come out. You don't even need to touch the playbook. It will just run it for you. That would be awesome, right? But OK, yes, sorry. So, so, so the question is that when we are typing the task description, would, would more detailed input at that help you, uh, help the recommendation engine to perform better, right? So I think yes, uh, but not necessarily yes, because again, like I said, models is still kind of fuzzy in a way. And when you type the task, we do not just submit the task description. We submit the context as well. So for example, the beginning of the overall, the other task, we will submit them as well. So the model would judge from the context and then give you the recommendation. So that's why you, if you try, try, on it, try it, if you have a different context, you might, be, might get back different recommendations. OK? Yep. Thanks. Sorry, I think you first. So the question is, is that uh, do we have statistics about how users are satisfied with the recommendation and how do we compare with co-pilots? Um, first of all, I do not have the statistics or, or I do not have it handy. You know, we, we, do, we do have a gauge of the sentiments. We actually allow you to also send back the survey, not just from the, um, the, the code completion. And we do try to um, you know, access that and use that as hopefully as input to the model training team, the data scientists to get them. But I, I do not have that yet. But and versus Copilot is quite different because we also, like I said, you know, we try to make sure the code is up to the quality and consistency for the Ansible you know, best practices. And also we try to attribute to who contribute that, which Copilot doesn't do as far as I know. Okay, any, there's another one, right? Yeah. yeah, my question was also related to the pilot, and you can compare them, and it's also already answered, and you have one. For example, I'm interested in opening, and I can go to the roles, and it somehow lets a lot of roles. Yeah, roles. Okay. Uh, can I use my roles for post suggestions, or maybe it will be the future? Yeah, so, 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 so the, the question is that comparison to Copilot, I think I, I tried that one. And the other one is that enterprise corporations, they have their own roles, right? So is there any chance to, to train on them? I believe so. I could tell you that that's one of the direction we are trying to, to go forward. Um, you will be able to train on your own. But as to details on when, how that can be done, like I said, do not trust me. I, I, and we do want to go to that that way because you want to customize it, you know, for your own. Yeah. So, out of time. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. If you have question, you can uh, tweet at me or you can talk to me afterwards. Initially, I have a I have a demo for the PR standing up using Argo CD, but I'm out of time. Maybe next time. All right. Thank you.